Um, thank you for that intro. Sorry about skipping ahead with my slides. I'm just obviously slightly overexcited to be um, talking to you all about digital twins today. Uh, so basically, my name is Vicky Reynolds. I am the head of digital for I3PT certification. Yes, it's a mouthful. It stands for independent third party testing um, and also for the, the sister company Cert Central. So I3PT provide a number of quality assurance and technical advisory roles on construction projects throughout the UK and Ireland. And Cert Central uh, is a software that uses live data analytics, simple interfaces, structured workflows, all to improve behavior on projects by making it easier for people to work together, track performance and to demonstrate quality. Um, I've purposely kept this presentation simple because a, I'm simple, and um, B, I think there are some incredibly simple high-level considerations that anyone needs to make before you begin to attempt to understand the more intricate technical nuances of digital twin technology. And these considerations are relevant whether you're a major developer wanting to roll out digital twins across all of your assets to manage them, uh, whether you want to form part of the national digital twin, or whether you're just a small subcontractor trying to feed data into a larger twin. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the importance of knowing why you want to pursue this technology, not only for the sake of getting the most value out of it, but also re to retain commitment from your boots on the ground. So the regular human beings who will either be the ones constructing your assets for you or maintaining and operating them. So, oh, there we go. Um, who am I? Why am I talking to you today? Um, I've held a number of roles across the built environment from document control to BIM consultancy, uh, digital pre-construction, digital upskilling in organisations and strategy work um, for a whole range of different types of companies. But actually before that, I worked as uh, an actor, a children's entertainer. I spent a few years as a teacher. I've worked in facilities management and in office management as well. And these are all roles that have had really very little to do with technology, but massive amounts to do with human being. Uh, in fact, up until about 10 years ago, I was a complete technophobe. And that cartoon there isn't, isn't too much of an exaggeration um, of my understanding of, of computers and technology. So when I joined construction, I had to learn really, really quickly. And weirdly, I became completely fascinated by the opportunity available if we could just digitalize a little bit more. And when I first started at Turner and Townsend, I had some incredible role models who taught me a massive amount very quickly. And um, I found that the communication skills that I picked up when I was acting and teaching and much earlier on in my career, um, paired with the fact that I had to decipher a lot of the digital jargon for my own understanding in this industry meant that I naturally fell into the role of translator um, between technical and non-technical people on the sites that I worked in and for the companies that I worked for. And eventually I became involved in some incredible initiatives like Women in BIM who aim to attract, retain and support women in digital construction for who I am now very proudly the global vice chair, um, the UK BIM Alliance, who I'm an ambassador for, uh, and I'm part of the digital special interest group for the CIOB. And of course, as, as Dun Duncan mentioned, um, I am one of the core team of the Digital Twin Fan Club, in which we explore and debate the concept of digital twins from a number of different angles. And we get a huge amount of input from some amazing experts in the field as well. Um, our podcast can be found at, at the Digital Twin on Twitter. Um, and as soon as we're able to resume physical meetups, we will be as well. Um, so that's enough of me plugging who I am and what I do. Uh, I'll crack on and I have to get something off my chest right away. Um, and that is a Digital Twin is not a product that you can buy or a person that you can hire. Uh, much like BIM, a Digital Twin isn't a one-off purchase. It's a commitment to a process. So however you decide to develop it and for whatever use to retain its twin status, and this has been said a couple of times today, it has to be maintained and it has to be a two-way feed of information. 
Technology alone can't create sustainable efficiencies in how we design, build and manage assets. It's just an enabler. It's not the end target. So if it's not that, what is it? Well, it's um, a digital replica of an asset which must, meet, which must represent physical reality at a level of accuracy suited to its purpose. And that's part of the definition taken from the Gemini principles, uh, from the Centre for Digital Built Britain, which you've heard all about already today. Um, and so a core principle of the definition of digital twins, as defined in the Gemini principles, is that we have to know what it will be used for so that we can determine the level of accuracy that is most appropriate that we need to achieve. And this is extremely important because if you don't know what problem you're solving, then measuring success or identifying a clear return on investment is incredibly, incredibly difficult. And this is where we can lose credibility as an industry amongst other industries, as a unit within this industry, and amongst the workers on our sites and the people operating these assets who might already feel like the digital goalposts are constantly moving, is, which was perfectly um, put by John in his last presentation. And so it's worth considering what success really looks like. Is it beautiful duplicate geometry, the physical and the virtual worlds almost indistinguishable? Um, or is it a shitload of data sensors um, and, and masses of, of data collection? Is it when we start feeding into a national digital twin of we if we hit the pot of gold then? Or is it when we're aligning ourselves to all of the applicable industry standards to every single letter? Or actually, would success be better defined as a reduction in energy costs, less wastage, better disaster planning, better health and safety, and better building security? And what I'm sort of getting at is when we talk about digital twins, it's really important that our targets are based around practical and measurable improvements to process rather than the way that we use the technology or the tool itself. So a digital twin should be the vehicle rather than the destination. There we go. And it's not a silver bullet. It won't allow us to sit back and let our buildings maintain themselves intelligently and it won't mean that we'll instantly become more efficient. Yet this is often how we market these new technologies to the wider industry, both formally and informally, just in chat, the way we talk to people on site. The amount of times as a contractor, I've had to respond to a tender in which a client has stated, we want level two BIM, because they've been advised that that's what they should ask for. And you get given pretty much no other detail about their asset requirements. And these tenders are a nightmare to respond to, both technically and commercially, because as with the now superseded term level two BIM, um, digital twin on its own is, is an empty term. It has to be supported by actual requirements and actual uh, use. So once we've identified what we're really trying to achieve, how can we give ourselves the best chance of success? So people have to engage with this process. You can have all of the digital aspirations that you want for an asset, but if people aren't engaging with the technology and with the data being collected, if they're not allowing that data to be collected, then it won't lead to any positive outcomes in the real world. And for people to engage, they have to understand what's in it for them, especially if they'll need to learn a new skill or their effort will need to be increased slightly. And people will only change their behavior or their habits when they have a good reason to. And these reasons will come either from being able to see a clear and tangible benefit for them as a human being or to avoid discomfort. And this can be on a minor or a major scale. So, for example, the use of a digital form for data collection may have bigger implications elsewhere. But what the site operative cares about is that it could save them having to scan and upload a whole load of forms and photos at the end of the day, meaning that they don't have to lose precious personal time anymore. And uh, on a bigger scale as well, no one wants to see the asset that they work on or in being the reason for loss of life. So if someone understands that a minor change in 
their working behaviour will have a larger positive impact on health and safety or sustainability, then they're more likely to make that change. But the benefits have to be tangible and measurable, at least to get started. Because in example studies, it shows that one in three people give up on their New Year's resolutions by the end of January, and only 46% of people continue their resolution past the six month mark. So human beings struggle to stick to change and commit to change, even when they really want it for themselves, if they don't get continuous positive feedback. So why on earth would they change their behavior at work if they don't fully understand why they need to? So if we take mobile phone technology, when was the last time you asked someone if they had a mobile phone? You just assume that they do. And if someone asks for your phone number, you give them your mobile number, not your landline, if you even still have a landline. And by 2011, it was estimated in Britain that more calls were being made using mobile phones than were being made using wired devices. Now, I do some work at a homeless shelter and even the guests there who have no home to go to will normally have a mobile phone and they'll be more upset if they can't access power to charge their mobile or access the Wi-Fi when they get to the shelter than by the fact that we don't actually have showers in house. And that's not because they have their priorities mixed up, quite the opposite. It's because a mobile phone provides technology that can solve real problems for them. So the user can find out what shelters are open that evening and in which locations. And they can see reviews about safety and security online. And that phone means that they can access their support worker or their family, even with no fixed address. Now, mobile phone technology has been around since the 1940s. But for 50 years, just being able to make or receive calls away from home wasn't enough to encourage people to adopt its use every day. The benefits of being accessible weren't big enough for people to take on the discomfort of a heavier pocket or invest their hard earned money on something that they didn't feel was a complete necessity. It was only really in the late 90s as phones got smaller and lighter and cheaper that people started to carry them. Then things changed again in the early 2000s. People got used to carrying around this piece of technology. Being extremely compact started to become less of a benefit, especially considering that for the sake of a slightly bigger handset, you could also get access to music and social media and essentially the whole of the internet. And a cheaper price was less important with a mo mobile phone. In, in some instances, that would become the most expensive thing that some people owned. And that's when the data collected from mobile phones and apps became really powerful. Just look at the way that mobile phones have been used to help assess the spread of COVID-19, analyze symptoms, pair up vulnerable people with local helpers. And that technology is solid, but the reliance is on human users engaging, not the capability of the technology itself. And if we were just 20 or 30 years behind where we are now, we wouldn't be able to do half of the things that we're doing with the data um, as we can now, not because the technology wasn't there, but because people weren't engaged. So why can't we just automate everything and bypass humans altogether? Well, quite frankly, we're years away from that level of automation and machine capability anyway, but equally, while computers excel at problem solving, they're less, like, they're less able to decide which problems are important to solve or to choose which approach is best applied when there are multiple options for a solution. And it's been well documented in research that complex questions are often best answered by diverse teams of humans rather than individuals or machines, even if the latter are theoretically more talented. Plus, the social, economic and ethical questions surrounding the subject of replacing a human workforce with robots and technology are vast and will remain debated and unanswered for a very, very long time. So the fact is that we will rely on human beings to engage with digital twin technology at so many levels and we can't possibly police everyone's use of it that our best option is to engage and educate with regular human beings making sure that people understand the value of data and the part that they play in the wider story that their actions personally have a much wider implication so basically Everyone has a responsibility to not hack or bypass data collection methods and that information management is an important process that should be respected.
and that brings me to a slight aside um, and i'm so pleased that it's already been covered a couple of times today um slightly off topic but i can't mention information management without mentioning standardization in common languages a good classification system or naming strategy needs to enable data usage not hinder its collection and this is important. So if you don't know what naming convention or classification system or common standard to use, or if you don't think there is one for what you're trying to do, then just make sure that whatever you do, you do it with common logic. If you call this element X, Y, Z, one, two, three over here, call it that over there as well. And this feeds into what Mark was saying about common rules earlier and what John was saying about fair structured data. Mapping might not be ideal, but sometimes it's necessary if you want to integrate different data sets and it's a hell of a lot easier if there's logic to what you've done rather than just complete chaos. and most importantly feedback your findings don't cover your exam paper that doesn't benefit everybody so i'll leave you with this um always consider why and make sure that you can communicate that why to every stakeholder in a way that's relevant to them. It doesn't need to be a big explanation, but it needs to be there. And once you've identified which problems you're initially trying to solve and everyone's engaged, you can better evaluate successes, incorporate lessons learned and solve even more bigger problems. And that's when smaller, really practical digital twins can be interconnected and provide bigger benefits that might not even have been intended for the original use. And that is it from me. Um, I left a bit of time for questions and conversation. Hopefully, we can um, bolt that on at the end. Thanks. <laughs>